Um, um, if you could help me remember someone at the end of the call to um, put end, that way John can edit it easily. But yeah, um, so I hope everybody enjoyed last week um, and has been looking at the the chapter for this week. So we're going to do chapter two and Jackson is going to be presenting. So take it away. Yeah, awesome. I just uh, I just posted a link to the to the slides as well in case people want to follow along um, while we go through it. Uh, I figured I, I missed last week's meeting, so I figured I'd just do a super super quick uh, introduction. Um, my name is Jackson. I'm a, a software uh, engineering manager at RMI, which is a kind of energy transition nonprofit, and I actually used to work with Maro here uh, pretty extensively. He was one of my mentors uh, a little while ago. Um, so cool to see a familiar face here. Um, so this, this chapter is, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the most hands-on chapter in the book. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be a lot of, uh, live coding together and, uh, you know, there's, there's still some slides, but it's mostly code chunks. And I want to make sure that, you know, I go at a pace where people are actually able um, to follow along. So please speak up if you're stuck or if something's not working or the code's not compiling um, and we can slow down because I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to lose anyone along the way. Um, and I also structured the slides so that there's like three um, coding checkpoints. So if you are totally lost, once we get to the checkpoint, you can kind of just like copy and paste <laughs> uh, what's there and we can we can catch back up because I know sometimes these live coding sessions can be a bit tricky. Um, a show of hands also, does everyone here already have, you know, cargo um, uh, installed on their machines and they're able to like, you know, get, get kind of cargo, cargo minus minus version can, you know, give you the correct output. Awesome. And everyone's got a text editor. Um, Assuming, <laughs> hoping. Yes, yeah. Very good. Super cool. Um, right then, I'm gonna share my screen. I've haven't actually presented Corto slides before, so I'm hoping <laughs> that I'm gonna be doing it right. But uh, if it's not sharing correctly, let me know. Is this looking good? Looking great. Awesome. So, um, yeah, the main learning objectives uh, of this session. It's really just to get familiar and like initial exposure with a lot of different Rust concepts. So we're not gonna go too far into detail on any of them specifically, but it's just sort of like a high level um, uh, exercise to see lots of different things. And then in subsequent chapters in the book, uh, we go a lot deeper um, into each of the each of the topics, right? Um, so by the end of the session, we're aiming to be able to um, build this simple uh, command line guessing game uh, that has you know, use, user interaction uh, through the command line. Um, you're gonna get some basic exposure to Rust syntax, to things that you're familiar with, I'm sure from R and everything else. So just kind of like def uh, declaring variables and functions and things like that. Um, we're gonna use the Rust standard library as well as an external crate. And we're gonna learn how to kind of manage uh, external dependencies using cargo and using the cargo.toml uh, uh, um, file. Uh, and then, yeah, kind of some simple error handling. We're gonna look at the result uh, enum type um, later on. And then some. we're gonna implement some like pretty standard uh, uh, control flow using conditionals and loops and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, we're basically, this is like a pretty canonical uh, uh, software development project uh, problem, uh, the, you know, the guessing game. It's a nice introduction to a language because you can look through uh, lots of different um, features. So the goal is uh, the program will kind of secretly generate um, a random integer between one and a hundred, uh, which will be held in memory. Um, there's going to be a command line, a prompt for the player to guess the number. Um, we're going to, you know, indicate if the guess is too high or too low. And if the guess is correct, we'll like print a little congratu congr 
yeah, congratulatory message um, and exit the game. And so that's kind of like, that's the acceptance criteria of, uh, of the program we're, we're trying to build right now. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, so yeah, as I said, I mean, if, if y'all can have, you know, your, uh, uh, terminal up alongside, I think that's probably the easiest way, um, to get this, to get this going. And, uh, the first thing we're going to do is, um, use cargo, uh, which is Rust's package manager and build tool. So car cargo is really awesome <laughs> with, within Rust. Um, and that's going to help you initialize the project um, with the given name and kind of set it up along with um, your your um, uh, package dependencies file and the, the main source code. Um, by default, when you do cargo new, it just kind of populates a really simple hello world program. Um, and, oops. Yeah, so I guess um, the first thing, yeah, all, all we're going to do is kind of do cargo new and this uh, this guessing game uh, directory, and then uh, hop a uh, CD into the the uh, guessing game directory. And I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for some thumbs ups to make sure that everyone's uh, along along here on the journey. <laughs> Wicked, super cool. Um, so if you type cargo run from uh from from the main directory there. That's going to both, um, uh, it's going to both compile and run the program. Um, so, so you should, if you type cargo run, you should see, you know, some, some messages, uh, come out in your terminal. That's like kind of the compilation step. And then the last line is going to be this hello world output onto your console. Um, you can also, uh, just compile the program without running it by calling, uh, cargo build. Um, so those are kind of two options there. And then. There's even more. We'll go much deeper into cargo um, in later le lessons, but um, you you also have the option to do kind of release and dev versions of a build and and different things, which we can we can look more into um, in later chapters. So, yeah, that's basically the the initial scaffolding. The the project's kind of set up, and we can start. We can go ahead and start editing the uh, the main .rs file. Um, so the goal right now is we want to start by by processing a guess that the user inputs into the console. Um, so we're going to process that guess by first prompting uh, the user for um, input and then storing that input as a uh, string in memory. And so to do that, um, the first thing we want to do is, is initialize a uh, uh, um, this new variable uh, to store the guess, and so if you 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 can pop open your your source slash main dot rs file. So this is the the sort of main entry point into your into your program. Um, we use in Rust the the let keyword um, to create variables, um, but variables in Rust are immutable by uh, by default. And so if you want to define a mutable uh, variable, variable, you have to use the let mute um, uh, uh, keywords together. And also note it's mute, not, not mut. <laughs> yes, some, some might read it. Um, well, I guess you can call it mut. I don't know. I call it mute. <laughs> uh, so this line of code right here um, that we want to add to the top of um, uh, uh, so inside our our main uh, function, it's going to initialize this guess variable um, using this string uh, a, a new function, which is uh, a, um, part of the standard library, um, and that's all it's going to do. So if you have that in your in your main um, uh, function, you can already try to try to. Uh, uh, Try to run that and make sure it compiles. So with cargo run, you can check that this compiles and and the program runs. You're gonna get some warnings because guess isn't actually used anywhere, and the compiler is gonna complain at you for defining something but not using it, which is actually quite nice. Um, but it should at least run and still just be a hello world uh, program. 
can let us stop here and make sure that we're all we're all at the same uh, at the same page and uh, everyone's got this guess variable defined. Awesome. Sorry if it seems like I'm going slow. I just I know sometimes it's it's uh, <laughs> easy to get lost in the in the live coding things. So now we want to actually get some receive some user input to um uh uh, uh to store in this newly defined guess um uh, uh variable. And so in the console or in the uh little code chunk here, th these are all the lines of code that we're gonna be adding. Um we have first and foremost, we have this uh we're bringing um the IO uh uh crate into scope, which is part of the standard uh, library. Um, so this is, you don't need to have any external packages here in, in here. We're just using standard, uh, the st standard uh, uh, crate, sorry, from from Rust. So when you type use std uh, colon colon io um, semicolon, and make sure you have that semicolon, it's super important. <laughs> um, that's gonna bring this crate into scope, which means we can start using the functions that are in that. Um, just as a side note, that comes at the very top of the of the uh, main .rs script, so that doesn't need to be within the main function. It's just at the whole at the at the top of the uh, of the script outside of the function. And then from within the function, we can um, use the print ln uh, macro. So, um, oops, oh geez, yeah, I told you I haven't used Carto slides before. <laughs> yeah so this uh um this exclamation mark is is defining a macro instead of a function which is um a difference that we're going to go into a lot more detail on in a in a later chapter um but just just for now be be aware that this is uh slightly different well yeah this is actually totally different to to um a function uh the print ln macro is going to print whatever uh, whatever string you give it as um, output to the console, and then we're going to call the standard input uh, function from this IO crate, and in particular, uh, um, oh sorry, the standard in function as well as the read line function, and we're going to save the input as a mutable um, uh, 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 variable within this within this guess variable. Sorry. There's some some input here that's interesting. So essentially, we're um, we're trying to append the input that we're getting from the user uh, to the empty guest string that we've already initialized. Um, the and here is indicating that we're referencing the variable guest that we've already created, and the and mute here is necessary because, as with all Rust things, um, references are immutable. By default, and because we want to append our input to to the guess variable, uh, we have to call an immutable reference to it so that we're able to actually um, uh, write to it. Um, I just saw some messages in the chat. Is everyone? Yeah, it's oh, okay, just awesome. uh, resharing the link because when you join, it doesn't have the history. Sweet. I think. Thank you for that. Um. So yeah, I think I'm pretty sure if we uh, run cargo run at, at this stage of the project, um, you should be prompted for input. That input gets saved to guess, and then it's still gonna it's still gonna just out, output the hello world at the end. Um, but the program should compile. So if we're all at this stage, I think I think um, yeah, the program should still compile, and it should still just be a hello world program with a a, a standard input. Uh, prompt at the beginning. So um, we don't have any error handling yet. Um, so we want to figure out how to deal with this, the potential for a failure um, on the input. And we want the program to crash if, uh, um, or we might we might not want to handle the error at all. We might just want to crash the program um, if if it gets a, a um, incorrect input. And so um, we can do this by using the dot expect uh, function. 
and maybe to to uh, uh, kind of go back a little bit. So the the read line function went with this with this mutable reference to guess. Um, it returns something called a result uh, uh, type in in Rust, and it's a super super common type in Rust, which is essentially um, it's an enum that we'll talk about again later that has two options. It either has the OK option, which means that you know the function ran as expected and produced a uh, um, yeah produced the output that you're expecting it to output, and it has the ERR. Um, uh, I guess yeah, option I think or the the branch of the enum, um, and this is kind of how we handle errors is by is by matching to uh, to OK and ERR, and so we can append this um, this expect handler onto as a as a method on the on the read line um, thing that we just called, and it'll basically this expect line will do uh, nothing if if it gets the OK result. Um, so if it gets the OK result, then it just happy days. It, it, it assigns it to the guess uh, variable. And if we get the error result, expect will handle that error result by um, uh, uh, crashing the program and printing failed uh, to read line or whatever, whatever uh, error message we want to give it there. Um, maybe another point, if you're not familiar with this, um, this style, uh, but it's common when you're when you're um, kind of stacking uh, method calls together to start a new line and then add the period and the method call um, uh, uh, in a complete line there. So this would be equivalent to saying having this function period dot read line period uh, expect. And notice the semicolon is just at the end of the of the expression of the total expression. That was a lot. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, how are we, yeah, are there any questions on, on that bit? Um, yeah, are we able to, to get to that point? Okay. I mean, I think the assumption is this is kind of like a big tour of all these things we're going to come back to, right? In more detail. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I also definitely don't fully understand all these, yeah. <laughs> all these topics. So I'm just kind of introducing them to the, the best that I can, but, uh. Yeah, well, we'll be going into all of these in, in a lot of detail. And if you if you care about that feedback, at least to me, who well, I'm absolutely new to Rust, the pace feels great, Jackson. Uh, I did a little bit of this myself, but still, I think it's really nice to to hear your nice, uh, you know, walking us through the process. I don't know what others think about that. I agree. <laughs> awesome. Happy to hear it. Um, sweet. So then, let's print out the uh, um this is kind of the final the final step of the first part of the guessing game which is we want to you know give the user some feedback to let them know that we got the guess and we will we do that by printing out uh, uh the guess in into the console so we're gonna add another one of these um print ln macros um and when you when you call you can basically you can call the print ln macro with a string and whatever you uh, format in the kind of squiggly bracket placeholder, whatever variable you pass through there is going to be formatted as a string. And then, well, sorry, formatted as a string if it can be, or error if it can't be, and then uh, uh, printed out to the console. Um, so this is kind of combi combining our user input and sort of feedback text um, into one into one function call, or one macro call, rather, and uh, uh, printing that out to the user. Um, Again, don't forget the, the semicolon there. Um, and so at this stage, you should be able to run cargo run. Um, it'll prompt you for a number. You can type in that number and it should uh, um, it should output uh, kind of you guessed whatever number that you've guessed. And it may still output hello world depending on if you've taken out that <laughs> that part of the program or not. Awesome. So, in case anyone's uh, in case anyone's lost, here's kind of the first um, checkpoint. So, your code might look a tiny bit different, but it should sort of broadly look like this. Um, and if you're behind, feel free. I think you can just cop like directly copy and paste this from the clipboard um, if you're totally stuck. 
cool beans. So now the next step of the of the program is um since it's a guessing game, we wanna we wanna define a secret or generate a secret random number. Uh we want to have a random integer between one and a hundred. Um uh that's kind of you know secret with the in the program that we're trying to guess. And to do this, we're gonna use um our first uh external crate called rand. Um and so this is a uh This is a crate that's hosted on crates.io, which is um, translate crate to package and crates.io to CRAN. Um, and that's uh, uh, kind of where this is hosted. And um, again, we use the use keyword uh, to bring this external crate into scope. And we're going to add this to the top of our to the top of our script. And now at this stage, um, sorry, at this stage, uh, your code won't compile. Um, and that's because the it doesn't actually have uh, uh, this. It, it doesn't know where to get this crate. It doesn't have this uh, uh, crate installed, and so it'll be trying to bring things into scope that it doesn't know where to get them from. Uh, so we want to we want to add this, um, or we kind of tell Cargo um, that we want to add a new dependency by writing to our uh, um, crates .toml file. Or sorry, cargo rather .toml file uh, under the dependencies square bracket header. Um, we can add the name of the crate that we want to bring into into scope, as well as the version number. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, you can. So you can do major minor patch um, referencing in this in this uh, uh, version number. So if you only add major, it'll it'll get the uh, kind of latest um, major release. If you only add it up to this level, it'll get the latest minor release. And then if you add the full um, declaration, it'll get it specifically that patch that you're asking for. Um, and you can do this. Uh, you can either open up the cargo TOML file and you know um, write all of this in manually, or you can also use the cargo add uh, uh, command line um, functionality. And so if you just type cargo add rand, It'll it'll um, populate it'll, it'll add the uh, dependency to your cargo TML file uh, to the latest um, version, and you can also type you know cargo add uh, rand at zero point eight, and it'll it'll add the the uh, zero point eight minor um, release to the file. So I think this is a way more kind of um, uh, or way less error prone way of doing it. I find because I'm. Anytime I can avoid writing directly to a file, I, <laughs> I do that. <laughs> um, so at this point, once your once your uh, um, external crate is defined here, you should be able to run cargo build, um, and that should uh, uh, it'll still pr probably complain at you because you're bringing a crate into scope but not actually doing anything with it. Um, but it should just be a warning, and it should still it should still run. I'm just gonna check the. Yeah, I I wonder if maybe just to, to the chat, I wonder if maybe they were trying to kind of show you that it was a pain in the butt so that when we get to the cargo chapter, you're more excited at how cool cargo is. <laughs> but uh I don't know, who knows? <laughs> it is a it is a nice functionality. I think really between cargo and the and the error messages in the compiler, there's a lot to a lot to like about the uh yeah, the developer experience in in, in Rust. Um, so, with this with this external crate brought in, uh, the external crate in scope. Sorry, just for reference, the top line here should be out of your um, main function. The second line should be within uh, the entry point within the main function somewhere. Um, once you brought the crate into scope. Uh, you can use this function called thread underscore RNG. RNG is random number generator or generation. And then you can define the generation range um, and give it uh, uh, this, um, this syntax. And uh, as a, uh, I don't really know what you call this, but th this is kind of a shorthand syntax for give me all integers uh, between, I, I Trying to remember now if it's one in a hundred or one in ninety nine or two in a hundred. I'm not sure what the, how the indexing works, but I think it's I think it's uh, all between. Uh, I think if remember to have ready was inclusive, right? Someone can okay. confirm that. 
Okay, it's inclusive. Awesome. Um, yeah, and so at this point, you should have this uh, secret number variable defined in your main function, and it should have um, a random number that's uh, uh, somewhere between between one and a hundred. Um, wait and make sure that everyone's all at that stage, and you know you should type with cargo run. Everything should compile and and run okay. Awesome. So now, um, now we're going to compare the guess to the actual secret number uh, to make sure, well, yeah, to see if the user wins. <laughs> so um, we're going to use the, uh, we're going to use a uh, functionality in Rust called match. Um, and essentially, um, uh, match is a way to sort of test equivalence between a, uh, a um, kind of variable and an option of an enum. Um, and so you could, you, when you bring the uh, CMP ordering um, enum into, into scope, uh, this ordering enum has three options, uh, less, greater, or equal. And when you call, when you call the CMP method on guess, with this secret number uh, argument, it's going to basically compare the reference to secret number here against this guess variable. And then if that returns a less uh, uh, um, option of the enum, you can, you know, you can do something with it. It doesn't necessarily be, need to be this, but you can run some code. Um, if it matches the greater option of that enum, you can do something. And if it matches the equal option of that enum, you can do something. Um, this is probably not going to be super familiar from R, although I think you can kind of think of it, um, well, I guess you can kind of think of it as like a case when within a data set, but it's not really exactly that, but there are some, I guess, some, uh, some ways you can internalize it. Um, we're going to like the match, I think there's a whole chapter specifically on match. Uh, so we'll get a lot deeper, um, uh, into it. Um, but for now, I guess without the super strong men mental model, can you kind of read the code and, and make sense sort of of what's of what's going on? I have a question. And you yeah. might not have answered yet. That's fine. Um, so is ordering less, ordering greater, or equal? Like obviously, like it makes sense what it is, but like, is this a is this a type? So I. I mean, again, that might not be. I'm. There's a large chance that I'm not giving the exact correct <laughs> answer it's to okay. this because I don't. I don't know this so well. But as, as I understand it, or, ordering is, or ordering would be the type, I guess. Yeah, it's an enum. It's an enumerated type, so it just has those specific values. Got yeah. it. And the, the, the future, options future that it can be well, yeah. exactly are are these three different options and it's essentially when you when you call the com the cmp function on a variable against another variable it returns one of these one of these three options and so then you're basically saying this this is going to return an option like what either less greater or equal and then we're matching whatever this mm -hmm. returns against one of these one of these arms here and then doing something with the with the uh, result Makes sense. Please, yeah, yeah this, knows this better. Please. Step this in. concept <laughs> is is all over Rust. I mean, the idea of using like uh, matching on the specific uh, types and the enumerated types like this comes up a lot. And sometimes they have data with them too. Like the uh, result type is a of this same kind of type that you can match on as well. It's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. And you don't, yeah, you don't have this in R <laughs> or Python. It comes from like the functional programming world, like Haskell and family. Awesome. Uh, I have a question. Chapter six. Chapter six. We'll go into that in more detail. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. I got uh, to somebody. Yeah, I have a question. On line two, uh, reference is used for the secret number. Why is reference not used for guess? 
I don't, I can guess. <laughs> I don't know if it's the right answer. <laughs> I, I would assume. Hmm. I mean, I would assume that we're, we're calling a method on guess itself against a reference to the other, to the other number. Um, I don't know if that's a, <laughs> if that's an answer, but that, like, I can imagine you don't need to reference. Method what... calls are kind of weird, um, as we'll see. So whether or not it gets a reference or not, it's determined by the actual method definition. Um, I, I don't know. What the, I don't know what the compare definition looks like. Maybe it takes it by reference or not. But yeah. So you you there is a there is a situation where you might need to have an and reference. No, it does it. Call. It does it automatically. It'll it'll take the right type, kind of. Ah, okay. Magically, <laughs> which is a little disturbing, but yeah. Got it. Thanks. Um, so I think, I think right now the code actually won't compile if you try to, if you try to run it. Um, I'm pretty sure because I think we're comparing things that can't be compared. But in any case, uh, if we all have the code written, we can, we can hop to the next step. Awesome. Um, so the reason the code wouldn't compile in the previous step is because we're comparing a, a string to an integer. Um, and we need to first uh, convert guess, which is a string input, to an integer type before we try to compare it um, to another integer type. Uh, and so to do this, I mean, I'm just here. You can just use the code uh, <laughs> that's written on the slide here. But basically, uh, what we're doing here is we're saying, um, we're defining a new, uh, uh, this is now immutable as far as I understand, because it's there's no uh, mute keyword before it, um, an immutable variable called guess. We're specifying its type here as uh, unsigned 32-bit uh, uh, um, integer. Um, and then we're going to define that as equal to the original um, uh, 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 guess variable. We use trim. Uh, to remove any white space from the string in case the user like typed a space or a, a carriage return or something like that. Um, actually, I don't know if trim removes carriage returns. I just assume that it might, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, and then we call parse on it, which is going to um, uh, try to convert it uh, from a from a string to an integer. And note that I said try because we then call expect, um, which uh, if it tries to convert a string, like for instance, A into an integer, it's not gonna know what to do with that. And so we call expect to um, handle the error uh, for for um, for when that happens. And again, I shouldn't even say handle the error because it doesn't handle it at all. It just causes the program to crash, um, but we'll crash the program <laughs> if you pass it the wrong, uh, the wrong input type. Um, so with this redefinition or with this kind of, um, wrangling of guess, we should now be able to compare it to, to the secret number using this comp line and the program should compile and run. And I'll wait for questions or thumbs ups if, uh, if we're all, if we're all there. Awesome. So um, I have another I have another um, code checkpoint here in case anyone is lost again. You should be able to just copy and paste this to catch up in case for whatever reason uh, your your program is not compiling. Uh, one thing to point out here is that uh, my text editor did some fancy styling <laughs> of the uh, the crate calls uh, and actually if you're calling if you're if you're bringing two different um, again I'm really not sure if I'm saying the right things if you're bringing two different crates from a external crate into scope or two different traits or or uh, um, parts of that crate into scope uh, you can you can um, save some space by calling them with squiggly brackets 
Uh, so this is kind of identical to saying That's use cool. STD comp ordering and use STD IO uh, in two different lines. By the way, just for fun, I did stick an ampersand in front of guests in that line 16 and it didn't, it didn't care. It was, didn't care. It didn't change, didn't change anything. <laughs> That's kind of, yeah, that is interesting. So, so it's just it's just deciding what to do with it within the method yeah. call. Cool. It's just so you don't have to. I think one of the things they're trying to avoid, like a C plus plus, you often have references you're calling methods on, and C plus plus you always had like just arrow. You could do yeah. like you could reference and then put the dot, but then you have to put like the parentheses around it. So they just did away with that and made it more easy, more easier. Syntactic sugar, maybe, what you call it. I couldn't find the unmute button. <laughs> uh, awesome. <laughs> so um, I'm going to, unless anyone has questions or wants to stop, I'm going to skip to the next step. Um, so. Up until now, we we have a um, a program which allows for a single guess. It checks if uh, uh, the guess is equal to the um, uh, uh, the secret number, and if it is, it, it you know prints out some answers um, or prints out some 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 messages. Uh, but it's gonna crash or it's gonna kind of quit the program out after one guess, no matter what, even if you're right or wrong. And so some behavior that we might like to add is uh, to continually prompt the user for another guess until you get the correct answer uh, to make it more like a game. And so we can do that with a um, with loop. And so the first thing we're going to do is you, you can place the entire guessing logic uh, of this game into, um, into this loop uh, uh, code chunk. So we define a loop with the loop keyword. And then you define a code chunk with these with these uh, squiggly brackets, um, and then the 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 code or the program is going to continuously um, reprompt reprompt you for a for a guess. Note that there's I don't think there's any actual logic uh, yet for if you if you win, it's just going to keep asking you no matter what. So the next thing we're going to want to do is actually quit the program if you win. Um, so this is kind of a, a zoom in of, um, the match expression that we spoke about a little earlier, which had those three arms that was matching against, um, uh, greater, less, and equal. And if you look at the, the code that you currently have in your guessing logic, you'll see this like forward, uh, a kind of arrow, um, and you should right now have a println um, uh, a macro after that branch, and so you can you can basically replace that uh, or put put that macro into a code chunk, and you can add more code uh, uh, to to um, to call there. I don't. I'm I'm trying to. Yeah, I, I know there's a difference between calling statements and expressions, and I don't I don't know what that difference is, but I know that there is one, and I should be calling it one thing and not the other. Um, but in any case, uh, <laughs> you can call within within this uh, these little squiggly brackets. You can call this um, the same kind of println macro that we had before, and we just add this break statement. Um, and the break statement that we add is going to exit both the loop and the program. And so this is our way of kind of gracefully exiting the program once you once you guess the the winning secret number and again I'll, I'll hold off a bit until uh until um we're all caught up here and also please ask questions in case in case anything's not clear Just looking at the chat, somebody said it's worth noting that standard doesn't need to be in the dependencies. Right. So what's the point? Oh, the point I think is just so you don't have to write standard colon colon compare inside the function body. You can just write compare CMP instead, right? I think, I think it was the... that you don't need to add standard to the cargo.toml 
um, dependencies list, I thought. Or I think what they're saying, you don't need to have that line at the top even, as long as you're oh. willing to write out standard colon colon CMP whenever you call the function. It's all that does, all the use statement does make a shorthand. It's, okay, it just makes it explicit. Yeah, I think that's true of uh, even RAND too, if you wanted, if you didn't have to use that use statement. It's in the crate, you just spelled out longhand, RAND colon colon RND. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. Oh, you had it in cargo. Standard in cargo. No, no, no. Exactly. Yeah, I was. I think the point is that you don't need to it, oh, okay. as to anything that's within a oh, like you, STD you, is the standard is right. the standard crate. So you don't need to like. Ex, ex, right. It's not. It's not in there. I think cargo ad will just ignore you if you try to do it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I wonder I if you can like. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. Never mind. Yeah, got a silly idea. Um, how's everyone doing? Be good to yeah. Go up to the next step. Awesome. Here anyway. Um, so another another uh, uh, improvement we might want to make is to actually handle the errors uh, that we currently have. Oh, sorry, to handle the errors that we might have, um, especially based on on user input, which is a common place for uh, you know weird, weird uh, um, behaviors to pop into. Um, so the, the code you currently have at this stage, um, defining the guess variable should be something along this line, um, but with a dot expect uh, uh, after the parse um, call here. And that dot expect is gonna have, you know, some string of, of, uh, of response that's gonna happen. Um, if it gets, if it gets a, uh, for example, if you input a letter into the program, um, the program is going to quit out, and it's going to give you an error message um, saying that it doesn't know how to convert a uh, a letter into a into an integer. Um, one improvement you might want to make, though, is you might not want your program to quit out if it if it gets um, if it gets this funky input. You might just want to restart the loop and reprompt uh, the user for for input again. And so we could implement that by replacing our dot expect, which was our kind of um, uh, kind of crashing logic with these uh, uh, squiggly brackets here and another, again, the semicolon, and then uh, adding our logic um, in between the in between the um, uh, the squiggly brackets. This is, ah, sorry, we're basically, I mean, we're not basically, we are adding another another case of this uh, matching of, of enumerated types um, into this uh, <laughs> function call. Sorry, this gets like complicated fast. <laughs> Basically, what we're saying is uh, we want to match guess.trim.parse. If we get the OK, um, uh, 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 again, I'm not sure if I'm saying the right thing, the OK type of this case. enum yeah. case is a case. Yeah, OK. The OK case of this enum, then we return the num that's the type that's within uh, the OK branch. So if we get okay num, then we return num. And if we get any kind of error, and this this underscore is sort of a placeholder for any type, then um, then we map, uh, then we return uh, continue, and that's gonna send us back to the beginning of our loop um, uh, to prompt the user for more input. If someone understands this better than I do, please <laughs> please step in. I know. I, yeah, I think that's that's sort of the basis of what I understand. I think this res the result okay error type is something that's going to come up like over and over and over again uh, in Rust. Um, I can't say that I understand it perfectly well, but this is essentially handling. Also, Jonathan's right. It's called, it's called variant, not case. That's it's called case in Haskell. That's got kind of confused there, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I know as I'm saying these things, I'm not using the correct, <laughs> the correct term. I always say so. case because so it almost me. Uh, so is it, it a variant like, of an enum or? A... Yeah. Okay. Of an enum. And it looks like this control flow stuff will come like the next chapter a little more deeper too. So I guess if you don't understand what continues doing it necessarily, but if you pro if you haven't programmed like in a C type language before, maybe does Rust, does R have a continue concept in a, in a loop? R has con continue. I think it's the okay. match. Uh, it's the match that's yeah. going to be the, okay. the more confusing. Uh, Even continue, you don't use that much. But match is completely, uh, you know, Probably something you haven't seen before, so that's perfectly fine. Yeah. 
should should expect to be ready for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's close to the oh, switch, but it's not cool. quite the same. Um. So just checking if people are, well, basically, if your if your code can compile and does what you think it should be doing. Okay. So I guess I'm a little curious. See, the syntax seems a little bit odd because, like, you have like before we had dot expect. Right, and we could just put an error message. Now we just have like a space with a bracket. I don't. Know, does anybody else find that odd? Instead of like maybe calling a method and then having like a the match. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. So, yeah. so the match keyword here is the... I think the important bit because then yeah, we're that's where you're match, you're matching this trim dot parse. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And so the the result like this is going to either give an okay or error variant of of this enum, and previously with expect, when it gets the error variant, it it crashes, and with the okay variant, it just it does nothing. It just mm -hmm. I guess returns whatever is the inside the okay variant. This is like a more uh, uh, precise way of dealing, like doing actually something with the error variant rather than just crashing the, the program. So I actually wrote a lot of these points that we're discussing. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, hoping that we're all at the same page. So this is sort of the final uh, code checkpoint for our matching game. Um, so if you got lost, um, have a look here. This is actually this code chunk scrolls. Uh, so it doesn't display the entire uh, the entire program there. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we're done. <laughs> we have a guessing game CLI made. Uh, I'll let you guys kind of tidy up the, um, the program. I think, um, the goal of this really as, as, uh, sorry, do you, do you prefer Ronald or, or Ron? Oh, either way it's fine. Thanks. So I think what, 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 what Ron was kind of saying is, you know, the, the point of this wasn't to perfectly understand any single part of this. I don't think, I don't think any of this is going to be totally clear. And the book does go into quite a lot of detail on every single uh, topic that we, that we looked at, but it's really just to get kind of a first, um, a first view at, I won't say most, but at least a handful of the different uh, common, um, you know, Rust uh, 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 syntax and kind of, um, like the basic syntax and, and things you can do with it. Um, and especially some of the topics like match and enums and things like that, that are, uh, that are quite useful in Rust. Um, yeah. I don't know if we want to open it up to a discussion or something like that. Andrew, I think you asked for a reminder about this stop, but honestly, I don't remember if you asked it kind of at this point or the very end of, uh, of our chat, just reminding you. Yeah, thank you. I don't know what does anybody know what is like typically just, done. Usually, just at the very end. Like sometimes you might have some uh, discussion about who's gonna do the next one or whatever. You can leave that after the end. But uh, for like if, for questions, and that we certainly want to include that in the YouTube video. People have questions about this material. Perfect. Okay. I, mean, I love the things, Jackson. I think a lot of the times I'm thinking, oh, this is, you know, because I come from, from R, I think, oh, this is similar to this, or this is not similar to that. It looks like this, but different to, in that way. Like, oh, I really like those, you know, kind of games that my brain is playing there. And one one comparison that I can see there, maybe, maybe some others felt the same, is that, um, you know, when, when the result has these two variants, okay, and error, it reminds me to the poor safely function that, you know, always kind of succeeds, but, you know, creates an object that has a result and an error as opposed to an okay and an error, but it seems to be like the same. And then you can inspect the error if you want and see what kind of error you got and, and do something about it, right? Uh, which is useful when you're iterating within a, um, like call to map or something like that, that you don't, you want to, you don't want to fail in the middle of a very long brain operation. Has anyone kind of felt the same, that similarity, or am I kind of totally off there? I think you're right on there. I mean, Per 
is the functional library for R, right? I mean, it's supposed to wrap, make a lot of things more functional. And this is a functional language concept. Uh, this is how Haskell does it too, it has the maybe type, it's the same kind of thing. Maybe you get an answer, maybe. <laughs> I think from, I see, from maybe my this own, also has a maybe, but. I really don't have a lot of uh, experience in program, programming languages beyond, you know, R, R and Python. So a lot of this is pretty, is pretty fresh for me. And I think uh, just this like upfront handling of upfront forcing you to handle and think about errors like <laughs> right away and kind of for forcing you to write um, more well thought out code is something I really appreciate about uh, about Rust because it's something that I had to, I kind of learned, you know, later in the game in R and you didn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily forced to do it right away. And this is something that you just, you can't actually write Rust code without, without thinking about this right away. Is the, I guess I, here we kind of hard code the, the variant of norm to unassigned 32 bit, but is there like, can you put various types or that it can handle? Uh, as in like, oh, uh, let's guess U32, match guess trim parse. Okay, gnome, it's U32. But could you have it handle other things or does it always, do you always have to specify what variant it's going to take? So like in, in defining the type, the type of guess in the, in the let definition? Yeah, and defining the I th type of, yeah, the result. I think we'll go, it'll go way, way deeper into types okay. in probably the next, <laughs> the next chapter. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, this the is just, ones, uh, sure. okay. I, I'm, I, again, I don't have a lot of experience. I think, I think there's like a logic to default to a certain type based on okay. what you give it. If you don't specify, if you don't specify the type upfront, um, I can't tell you what, what that was, is going to be. Um, but I think there, there is a, yeah, some assumption as to like, if you give it a negative integer, it's going to. It's going to have to be a type that allows for, for signed. Uh, or that. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 I remember in the book it said like U32 is like a kind of default one that handles positive integers. So, okay. Sorry, I might. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. Unsigned. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The sign there unsigned, is just yeah. the, the mi minus sign or plus sign. Yeah, it's called type inference. Like one at one point we told it the type was U32. Everywhere else you can figure out, okay, now I know that num is U32. Now I know that uh, even uh, the random number generator uh, secret number, it now goes back and now knows that that has to be U32. So it does inference. You can put those in by hand. My my editor, I use Visual Studio Code and uh, I have the Rust plugin, I forget what it's called now, that Andrew recommended. Um, was it Andrew? I think it was Andrew recommended. And it actually puts in gray what the types are, are that I didn't type in. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> you can see on the editor, you can see what the types are, even where I didn't put them in. Yeah, I, ha I have that same one. I did not know that's what the gray meant. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Yeah, those aren't actually in your source code. They're just like, it's just telling you, oh, that must be a string. I figured it out for you. Sweet. Which extension was that, Andrew? Do you remember? Uh, Rust Analyzer. Ah, yeah, there it is. Okay. I I have heard that that when projects get really, really, really large in Rust, that the analyzer can be a bit of a pain in the butt because it takes way too long <laughs> to run. Um, I believe it. <laughs> which is just something to, I guess, maybe like if your project gets huge and you're wondering why it's taking long to. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, I know more Rust by then. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're running out of time, and I have to go. So um, let's, everybody, thank you, Jackson. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. uh, this was really good. Uh, this is, yeah, really good praise. Very detailed. Very good explanations. Thank you. Um, no and reminder to check out the schedule and find a, a topic or time that works for you. Perfect. So maybe now yeah, is that time I'll to be doing stick that this week. So I also 
I'm new to very, a lot of concepts, so we'll have fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here, so you're not doing exactly. it together. I love yeah, it. Best way to learn, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay, now the reminder then to put that stuff under.